From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Hey everybody, welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Bioethics Tower here in Kansas City with a great webinar today. Thanks once again to the Claire Giannini Trust and Children's Mercy Hospital for supporting these webinars. Before I introduce our guest speaker for today, let me remind people of a couple of things. We have a busy couple of weeks ahead. Next week, we have another webinar, same day, same time, next Thursday at noon. Jennifer Blumenthal Barbie's coming up from Texas to talk about biases and heuristics and their impact on clinical decision making. That's one you don't want to miss. And a week after that, same time, same place, Thursday, March 1st at noon central, James Mumford will be talking about reproduction in an age of mechanical reproduction. So you all want to read Walter Benjamin's famous essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, to prepare for what Professor Mumford might have to say. For those of you who haven't joined us before for one of these, here's how it works. I'll introduce our speaker. He'll speak for about half an hour on ethics of child care conversations with Muslims. Uh, after that, we open it up for discussion. If you're online, there's a little chat box in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You can type in questions at any time and we will read them out. Or if you're a tweeter, you could just tweet your questions to us at hashtag CM Bioethics. Also, if you want a certificate of attendance for having attended this, you can just go to our website and look for certificates of attendance and download your own. We do those on the honor system. Now it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Abdulaziz Sashadina, professor and IIIT chair of Islamic studies at George Mason University. Professor Sashadina has studied in India, Iraq, Iran, Canada, and now has been at George Mason University in Virginia for about 30 years. Uh, he's a professor of Islamic studies there. And he's written on a wide range of topics uh, in Islam and philosophy, including Islamic bioethics, the Islamic roots of democratic pluralism, and the Quran and religious pluralism. And we are thrilled that he's come here to talk to us about Islamic bioethics in children. Welcome. Thank you very much. Greetings to all of you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here um, in Kansas City. Maybe this is my second visit in 50 years in the mm -hmm. U.S. So it's a very special visit. And I, I really want to share with you uh, not only expertise as an academician, but I also function as the community leader. I'm also a chaplain at the University of Virginia medical system. And I have worked a lot in the ethics committees, both here and also in Iran and Iraq, where the new discipline is being introduced. I must also say that whatever I say today is not in any sense the fixed and absolute opinion. Rather, I must me make it clear that it is normative, no doubt, I still based on the Quran and the tradition. It is based on the religious, you know, text of, the, of Islam. And yet, I must say that in the absence of a church and clergy in Islam, we don't have, you know, a fixed opinion that we can say, we can cite as the opinion of the entire community. Oh, we know very well that in North, North America, the community, Muslim community is multicultural, multilingual, and from different parts of the world. And this is the beauty of being in America. We are all together in the very same kind of situation when it comes to health care. I must say that all the problems faced by any community, any human community in this part of the world, are also the problems faced by Muslims in this part of the world. We are today 
mainly interested to learn about the child care. And I must say that it's not only child care, but it's also mother's care. Because child and the mother are together. She is the one who bears the child. And therefore, it's quite interesting that in Islam, mother's station is higher than the father's station. The prophet of Islam made it quite clear that the mother is highly respectable. And if there is a conflict between mother and a father, mother's opinion carries the day. So when you look at that situation, you can see quite clearly whose opinion will be important in the healthcare institution. Who will make an ultimate decision that should be respected by the medical team? They should also be respected by the family and the community. A little warning is in place, but that's not what the culture does. The culture does not give a woman that kind of free hand in deciding the welfare of her child. Sometimes the man overrules. Husband has overpowered some of the decisions that the wife has made in terms of the welfare of the child. So we do know about this conflict. But what we are faced with in North America is there's a new crop of mothers who are well educated, who know their rights, and who fight back to make the right decisions in terms of the welfare of their children. And it could be in the hospital situation, and I'm talking about general situation in the society, who is there to take care of the most vulnerable citizens of our country. I see them as children, as the most vulnerable, you know, um, victims sometimes, sometimes those whose rights are not even recognized by their parents out of cultural, you know, requirements, whereby the children are regarded as almost the property of their parents and not individually seen as having their own dignity. So let's, let's proceed. And I'm, I'm, as I said, that this is a conversation. I'm, I'm not going to give you any hint that this is the opinion that we are talking about. And therefore, I think I want to consider a very important issue in bioethics today, that religion is a newcomer. In bioethics today, religion is a newcomer. We still have not defined the parameters of decision-making in terms of our medical experience, clinical experience, and in terms of who can speak for those who are unable to speak for themselves. What we would consider to be a very important part of any medical treatment is a person agrees to what you know, has been decided in the clinical setting, in the hospital setting. So let's, let's take it I think as an important starting point that there is no culture in the world that I have traveled around. I've traveled around the world three times, visited all the countries of the world. I have not come across any country where a child is not respected. Child is important. Children are taken a lot of care about. And therefore, one can say that their special care has been on the minds of those you know, societies who are now instituting new institutions to take care of the children. Also, religions are striving to defend the rights of the children because they can't speak for themselves. But well, we are here in a double catch. It's not only the rights of the children, but also the rights of the mother to speak. So let's keep that cultural context in, in proper understanding that in Muslim cultures, it's mostly fathers who make the decisions and not the mothers. But what I'm going to argue today is that without mother's participation, I don't think the child's welfare is truly taken care of. Because she is the one who knows the child. She is the one who understands the child's language sensitively. In other words, she is the one who knows what the pain is, and she can explain it. In other words, in Muslim cultures, children and mothers are in need of new protections, institutional ones, and also those that are providing the health care. On both levels, we find that those institutions are now very important. There is a hospital in Iran, for example, run by women from top to the bottom. There's no men allowed. And you can take your children there 
and see that they are cared for properly. There's one hospital in the holy city of Mashhad that I visited where all of them are women. Administrators, physicians, everybody is women. And they are taking care of their you know, needs and the rights. And they are the ones who argue that the medical, medical field has not taken enough has not paid enough attention to the women and children in those cultures, which is true, by the way. So we find that children depend naturally on surrogate decision makers. They are not in a position to make any decisions. They are vulnerable to avoid the decisions, and therefore both parents and societies are involved in making those decisions for them. Let's understand one thing which is very troublesome in Muslim theology. Human suffering needs to be understood. I, I must say that I think the most important issue that I have seen in Muslim theology being raised is the suffering of the children and animals. Because animals also cannot protect themselves. They are under the mercy of the human treatment many a times. In other words, there are two sections in Muslim theology that are very much concerned about showing us how the suffering should be evaluated. What are the key elements in that suffering that we need to understand? First of all, human being has stewardship of the body. We don't own our body. In other words, we don't even own our children. They are independent from us. It's very interesting to note that in the Hanafi Sunni law, a fetus is treated as an organ and can be donated as an organ. But in the Shia law, the child, like in Christianity, from day one has been ensouled and is conceived and the dignity is preserved. So you have two different ways of looking at a child even at that stage. And therefore the question arises, how do we evaluate their suffering? We don't own them. Should we be concerned about that? Merely caretaker, we are the caretakers, and the real owner is God. Therefore, the child is a trust of divine to human beings. They are treated as a trust. What is so important about the trust? It should be returned intact, the way it has been received. That's the meaning of trust in Arabic. Amana in Arabic means that which I hand you over, and I'm expecting you to return it the way I have handed it to you. So the child is also regarded as divinely handed to the human beings, to the parents, to the mother especially. And it is she who really is uh, assigned as the very important caretaker. Now, suffering is a form of a test. Muslim theologians have asked this question hundreds of times. Why do children suffer? If I'm a sinner, I should be the one to suffer. Why should my child suffer? And it has been something speculated about in the Quran also. The Quran says, surely God will try you with something of fear. And most of the commentators of the Quran say, this fear is about the personhood of the child. Because you don't know exactly how to take care of it. And you still are assigned the role of a trustee. And you don't know the full implications of what does it mean to be a trustee? Should they be allowed to be hungry? What happens? And then Muslim tradition comes quite clearly across that mothers have been praised by the Prophet because they remain hungry and feed their children. In other words, they don't come first when it comes to the children's child care. Child care. Moreover, let's keep it in mind that Muslims don't look at suffering as evil at all. It is not evil, and therefore, what human beings must always do is to find out what is the purpose of me going through this suffering? Why am I being put through this test? And many times, a mother has responded to me in my chaplains in the hospital, Muslim mothers have done it, that I am being tested by God because I was not a good person. And here I have a child now. What will I do? In other words, there is 
what we call self-blaming going on and you try to somehow negotiate said no that's not true god doesn't take revenge on human beings because god has written for himself compassion for human beings so you can see very clearly that suffering has a positive indication provided person like me goes in the hospital as spiritual leader, spiritual guide, and tells them, no, it's not like that. God is not so unkind. God is merciful, and so on and so forth. So that language becomes very important in the child care, especially when the children are innocent. And why do they suffer? And that question comes also for the animals. Why should animals, and there were Muslims who were vegetarians, who did not kill animals for food. And they believed that the moment you eat animal, your heart becomes dark. The light of God will not come into you. So vegetarianism was prescribed by some of the Muslim scholars. They said, no, should not kill animals for food. God has provided some different things for you to eat. So all of this, I think, brings me to a very important observation about human decision to end suffering. What if I go through suffering? What am I supposed to do? God's immutable degree is, decree is revealed in law. So when the law says, this is what you need to do, this is what Islamic law does say, you know, it says, you know, you need to take care of the child, you need to breastfeed your child for two years, not less than that, you should do that. And you can demand money for the breastfeeding. That's what, by the way, Islam does it. Don't worry, you can take money from your husband, that I'm feeding your child. And you should take care of me. You should provide me with, with clothing and the house and everything. Therefore, it's very interesting in divorce laws, for example, if the woman is pregnant and she gives birth to a child, she is supposed to receive all the help from the husband's family to, for the upkeep of the child. In other words, we are now asking this question that if it is the immutable decree, it doesn't change. Where, who, in, where not the aisle, not only the right to die is not recognized. The right to be assisted in dying is also out of question. What do we do? I had this important you know, situation in California. There was a child born with, without the lower stem of the brain. And the child was kept alive. But it was suffering at all levels. The doctors did not know what quality of life would there be. And finally, it was to be determined the mother was not willing to give up. She knew that the child will not have the quality of life. And yet she had to make a de decision about it. What should she say? Can I end the life of my child? You see, this is the old question that comes up. Can I do that as a mother? No, I think this is where collective decisions are extremely important. The Quran speaks always about collective decision making, shura. You must consult. You must talk together. No one person should say that this is what I want to happen. Collective decision by healthcare providers, including attending physician, family, based on the principle of no harm. Any of my decision cannot cause harm to anyone, neither to the mother nor to the child. And it does not then, you know, it evaluates how to withdraw, when to withdraw the treatment because it allows you to assess it in a collective way. Always collective decisions are the ones in which God is also participating, according to Muslim belief. When it is collective, no one person is holding the card in his or her hand. And it's important to do that. Let's move on now. But treating the children, in Muslim understanding, medical treatments could be of two kinds, and I think this is general. I would say this is a very universal language. We talk about it. In Catholic bioethics, we speak about it. In Jewish bioethics, we speak about it. What we find, there's a general distinction made between optional and obligatory treatment. Sometimes the medical team does not believe that optional treatments are any useful. And therefore, they decide against them. And there are times when, you know, obligatory decisions cannot be overlooked. So you are always concerning when you make the decision about the children who are not able to make decision themselves, the matter becomes extremely sensitive. I would say religiously sensitive and also ethically sensitive. 
because most of the things that are happening now are in the hands of the medical team. They are the ones who are really responsibly taking upon themselves to determine what will work, what will not work. But in the middle of it, I have I have heard this in my clinical situations as a chaplain. I've heard about the quality of life. Like the child that I spoke about, the baby that was born in California in Sacramento. And there was this whole question was, what kind of life would this child have without the lower brain? And how long the child can live actually? The doctors were saying cannot cannot live because they're all, there are so many functions that are related to the lower brain. In other words, here was a question of you know quality of life of infant. And it raised cautiously, since it is incompatible with the distinctions and rules connected with critical care, like life-sustaining treatment used for terminal ill, cannot give you a consent. It's a mother's consent, it's a parent's consent, or it is their decision. Islamic bioethical principle of no harm, no harassment. La darar wa la dirar fil Islam. The Prophet taught this very clearly. Look, in any decision that you make, don't cause harm to anyone. And any decision that you make should not be reciprocal to harm doing to you. Somebody did harm to you, don't respond with harm. Respond with forgiveness. Respond with something better than that. In other words, no harm, no harassment is evoked and discussed to establish a presumption in favor of providing life-sustaining treatments for all the patients with irreversible conditions. Sometimes the conditions are irreversible. You can't do anything when the medical professional opinion is very well calculated and very well estimated to be that way. During the deliberations, use of life-sustaining treatments comes up in the light of the strong probability that occasionally these interventions violate person's interests. When I'm talking about persons, it's too subjective though. But many times the whole question comes up, who makes those decisions about the patient's interest, especially if it is a child's interest? The child who cannot speak for himself or herself. What, does, what happens then? And I think those issues are extremely important when treating the children. Children pose a very special concern in the medical treatment. You know it quite well. You are in the children's hospital. I have been to the children's hospital quite a few times. And I still remember going to children's hospital in, in, in Toronto, one of the very good ones where you find how decisions are made. And it's extremely difficult for the medical team. Nurses, parents, everyone, sometimes it's just impossible to come to the right conclusion. But what Islam would do is that, okay, why don't you sit together? Why don't you consult one another? Find out what is the best solution and then go ahead and do it. We also are very much concerned in Islamic ethics about prima facie obligation. What exactly am I supposed to do when the child is brought under my care immediately in the emergency section of the hospital? The child is brought. I know that I need to do something. Deliberations about the conditions that justify withholding or withdrawing treatment are at the center of deliberation. In light of the Islamic principles of principle of averting probable harm. Nafi darar al-muhtamal that al-muhtamal is probable harm. It's very interesting to see that Muslim jurists will tell you that if there is benefit of even one person more, 51 person, then you should carry out the treatment. If there is a harm of 51 person, then you should also carry, you should not carry out the, you know, the treatment. In other words, it's quite mathematical. They use algebra, by the way. And they come to the equation and say, okay, all this is done. If this is done, this is going to happen. 51 person, 52 person. Then accordingly, you make a decision. The Sharia presumption about the duty to cure. That's what the Sharia says. You should be able to cure the disease. Medical institutions are for curing the disease, curing the, the patients against the medical presumption about duty to treat under all circumstances. Are we obligated to treat under all circumstances? Should we do that? Ethical dilemma is encountered when a patient with irreversible medical condition is dependent upon surrogates. They are going to make decisions 
for the patient. It's very tricky when it comes to children. One is always afraid. I have seen parents freaking out. They are not able to do anything. They totally depend on the medical team. Let them tell us what is involved, because we don't understand this. Critical question, who represents the infant? Parents or medical team? My prescription in the hospital situation, in the healthcare institution is, it is a collective responsibility rather than one person making the decision. There are times when the mother becomes, she is the main person who will make the decision ultimately, because she is the one who is going to carry the burden of caring of the, for the child. And many times that is respected. Will the delay in reaching a decision cause incremental harm? That's a very important issue. Because if, is, if the situation is going to deteriorate, who is going to be responsible for that? Because we can be questioned about that. And there's always, by the way, I've seen in the Muslim culture, and I, I do not want to generalize it, but several cases in which I have been called upon to make, to give my opinion, I've found that a woman's position is very delicate. She's, whatever she says, one day it's going to be to come against her, you know. And I, I find that, and I have, I've seen their correspondence to me, their emails to me that, didn't I tell you this is what's going to happen? I'm going to be blamed for this. I'm going to be, you know, held accountable for this one. And I think it's, it's partly because she has the burden of providing the care. In the male-dominated patriarchal societies, women's role is very, very difficult. I must say there's a lot of burden. And if you want to see it in, in, a, in a study that was done by one of our PhD students at UVA, um, Farhat Muazzam is a doctor. And she wrote about the kidney donation in Karachi in Pakistan. And you can see what kind of pressure mothers go through, sisters go through, women go through in general. In other words, the culture almost takes it for granted that she is the one who is going to make the sacrifice. And there is no, you know, male participation at some points. And I find it deplorable that male are not participating the way they should be participating. Things are changing in North America, by the way. And there's more awareness of the male-female accountability and equality in terms of their taking the responsibility for the child's care, for the child's upbringing. So this is where I find that delay sometimes is detrimental. Weighing harms with benefits is very important in Islamic legal training. Ethical questions facing all involved parties revolves around identifying circumstances that make life-sustaining treatment unavoidable, unavoidable. There's an opinion among Muslim jurists that once you start life-sustaining treatment, you can't stop it. That means once you start the machine, once you start the ventilator or respirator, a respirator, then you have no right to stop it because the sacred life anymore is involved. How about the futility of the treatment? How about if we, if we realize afterwards that it's not working? The way we thought it would work is not producing the results. Determination of balance between benefit and harm in large number of cases fall on religious leaders. This is where we play a very dominant role. Whose opinion on withdrawal of it or withholding is sought at this time? Now, withdrawal and withholding is like tube feeding the child, nutrition, hydration. How do we handle that when there's no clear cut answer about curing the child? There's no answer. You do PEG, for example, in the, met, in the, in the, in, in the child care, PEG, it's extremely difficult to do that. I have heard from the physicians, it's not easy to implement those decisions, tube feeding. Sometimes the parents are demanding. Sometimes religious leaders are telling that, oh yeah, you have to keep them alive, this and that. And, but my own solution has been that, let's sit collectively and ask this question, are we curing the disease? Are we helping the ill patient to become better? 
or are we increasing the problems? In other words, the answer is very clear. The Sharia is very clear. Your obligation is to treat if there is a hope of curing. If there is a no hope for curing, if three medical personnel, if three physicians say, we all agree, nothing can be done anymore, then that opinion should carry the weight. In other words, they are allowed to then impose their will on the family, saying that, look, we have told you, it's not going to work. Then, you know, one, one additional, perhaps, factor that is very important to keep in mind is in North America is the insurance companies. Yeah. Health insurance, who, who actually I found that many times they are the ones who make the decisions, unfortunately, because they would say, we are not going to pay any more bills. And the, pay, and the family, even the mother sometimes gives in that, well, we don't have any, enough resources then. In other words, there are so many catches there. And when you look at the entire picture, it emerges to me, I think, human situations are not very easy. They're not easy to understand when it comes to finally, where do we draw the line? Conditions to determine quality of life judgments are most precarious in bioethics. We really don't know what we are doing when we talk about quality. And there is no clear, I think, clear-cut scientific answer to whether a particular treatment would produce the result we are expecting it to produce. It is important who determines the quality of life. It is important to note that when quality of life is sufficiently low, further intervention produces more harm than benefit to the patient. We've seen in the case of the children, we've seen in the case of the terminally ill patients, there's more harm being done rather than helping them out. For such a patient, we need only to determine which medically indicated treatment is obligatory, which is optional. The choice is between further palliative treatments and no treatments. Mental retardation has been used, by the way, therefore I'm bringing it up, is irrelevant in determining whether treatment is in patient's interest or not. Sometimes, you know, they use that, oh, they're not, you know, capable. There is something, the mother suffers from that or the father suffers. And I, I think they are, they are very slippery slope. You know, we really don't know where to stop when, when we start doing that. Finally, I would say, medical treatment of the terminal ill, adult, child, is ruled as optional by some ethicists in the Islamic community. Even if it could, A, prolong life for an indefinite period, because we don't know the quality of life, what will happen, we have no idea. B, if the patient is incompetent, child, somebody who is not able to make the decision in coma. Non-maleficence in Islamic bioethics means obligation not to inflict harm on others, including the patients. You can't inflict harm. Does this principle imply the maintenance of biological life under all circumstances? Because sometimes that's what it leads to. Or does it require the initiation or continuation of treatment without regard to the patient's pain, suffering, and discomfort? I think the answer needs to be searched and deliberated among all those concerned to provide the health care of the children or anybody in that situation of terminally ill who have no hope to live and who need to be helped out, how to understand it. In other words, what we are doing here is that we are bringing about a very important precocious attitude that is important in child care. Precocious measure, measure which is ehtiyat. ehtiyat in Islamic law, in bioethics. In bioethics, killing is conceptually and morally connected to absolutely unacceptable act. You can't do that. You know, our medical oath is quite clear about it, that no, you will not do that, you will not engage. Outside medical circles, as in the administration of justice, killing is absolutely, is, killing's absolute un unacceptability is not assumed. Killing in self-defense or killing to rescue a person endangered by other person's immoral acts prevent us from judging an action as wrong merely because it is killing. In the case of children, in the case of children, the burden of any critical decision 
is upon surrogates who can avoid evil consequences of particular cases in healthcare. There is no clear cut edict, fatwa, to tell you what to do. Believe me, I have participated in many of those cases in the hospital, in the clinical situation. It has been extremely difficult to make any decision for the children. I'll stop here and wait for your comments and questions. Thank you. I have a feeling there will be lots of questions coming in because this just scratched the surface in so many ways. I have about eight myself, but let, let, let me start. Uh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me remind the people online, if you do have a question or a comment, and um, let me just ask your permission on this one. Earlier when we were talking, we brought you a few quite specific cases and asked about the sort of Islamic thinking about that. If people have those, would you That's be? That's right. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. It would be good so, to hear that. Yeah. Uh, if you have a specific yeah. issue, tiny preemies, transgender children, organ transplant, please write, write those in as well. Uh, and we'll read them out here and uh, discuss them. Let me ask you about this concept of a shura, yeah, which I had yeah. not heard of before, collective yes, decision-making. Right. Yes, that's right. Um, presumably the parents are involved, the doctors, God. Is there? A, but you also said there is no uh, sort of formal clergy. There's no formal clergy, are but they? there is always a spiritual guide in okay. Muslim. The imams today in the mosque function as spiritual guides, those who are aware of uh, biomedical issues, okay. who are aware of the rights of the patients as described in the law, Islamic law, mm -hmm. and in the culture. So, so do meetings actually occur involving all these it people? Does, yes, the it does, yes. Many times we have seen, and I have sat in those meetings with spiritual leaders, social workers, uh, doctors, mm -hmm. hospital administrators, and sometimes a lawyer or two from the hospital mm -hmm. to protect the hospital from any kind of, you know, uh, future problems. So Shura is uh, what the Quran says, your collective decisions are better than individual imposition of an opinion on each other. So that you consider all the pros and cons of a decision making. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important principle in the Quran. And therefore, in Muslim cultures, even in conflict resolutions, shura has worked much better. It has provided with a way of bringing conflicting parties together. Mm -hmm. This also happens in the hospital. The mother has a different opinion. Grandparents have different opinion. Physicians have different opinion. Nurses, everybody, you know, is working on the case. And sometimes the case is so important that if you don't engage in shura, then you are hurting the actual outcome. Because what God, God's participation is when he likes to see human beings consulting in sincerity. Uh -huh. They're sincerely concerned with the case. So, do, <laughs> sorry yeah. for my naivety, it's, but is it something where people say, like, we need to do some shura now? Yes, we, we yes. Need, we yeah, need that, to have a shura meeting. That's right. Shura would be an important institution in the hospital yeah. situation, especially in palliative care, yeah. uh, in the care of the children, where decisions are not clear-cut. Mm -hmm. Although the physicians feel quite comfortable in administering certain treatments, but they're not very sure if this will be approved by the parents or would they be able to, you know, uh, convince them about this because they, they look... On the surface, they might not look attractive at all, mm -hmm. the decisions that are making. So here the shura, consultative body, is made up of immediate family, doctors, nurses, social workers, everybody in the hospital is now sitting together so that nobody says, I made it, made a unilateral decision about this. Mm. There's no unilaterality when it is human life concerned. Mm. And there's no leader. Of this meeting. The leader sometimes it emerges many times I have seen that the burden falls on me as a spiritual leader. Okay. As a chaplain, 
I'm the one who said, what do you think Islam would say? What do you think God would approve? Uh. And here I become the spokesperson for God. Or, you know, spokesperson for the tradition. And I, I think that uh, it's a tricky part, but yeah. I don't hesitate because I don't have any access to grind. I don't have anything to benefit or to harm. I'm doing my service. I, it's a volunteer. I'm a volunteer. Mm -hmm. adjunct chaplain, you know, I'm, I don't draw salary on my work. So I'm, I'm free to you know, negotiate my space. But I find that the burden many times falls on me as a, as a chaplain. Right. Another quick question. Uh, you started by saying uh, that the mother's decision is, uh, uh, the mother's the ultimate decision maker for children. and. Uh, suggested that that is that comes from Quran. It comes from the tradition. The Prophet was very adamant about mother's rights. The Quran has a verse in which it says it talks about the rights of the parents, and it just moves to the mother. Mm -hmm. She carried you for nine months. Mm -hmm. She fed you for two years. She has even more right to be treated kindly. So it, it immediately, you know strikes that God has more concern with mother's, you know, rights. Because the father is a man, he will fight back, you know, he will, he's a man. He's a male show in his society, you know, whereby the man says, I'm strong, I'll fight. But a woman is the one who needs protection. So yeah. we've had cases where uh, the father has come in and says, I'm the head of the family, I'm the head of the household, only talk to me. Don't talk to her. Yeah. I need to protect her from the emotional stress of this decision. Uh, this is cultural rather than religious. It is not ethical at all. Uh, in culture, in patriarchal culture, man is the head of the house. Uh, although the prophet himself came from a matriarchal culture where mother was important. <laughs> so Medina, you know, the mothers were important. The husband came to visit the wife. But there, there was the culture of matriarchal society. Patriarchal society uh, is the one that has somehow determined the role of a man as a head of the house without consulting the woman. But what, from what I understand reading the Quran is that a mother is no less important. Mm -hmm. And she's not only emotional sometimes, she is, she is even more sensitive than the man is in matters of the child care. Because she knows about her children better than the man does. So, oh, so I think you should take it with a grain of salt when the, when, when the man comes and says, are you talking from the Quran or are you talking from the culture? You may, you may put this question. Or and maybe, I think the question will be answered, oh, this is Islamic. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll ask my imam. <laughs> so <laughs> you can give me a call immediately. <laughs> so, maybe I will even, right. even suggest that we have a little more shura. That's, <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think that unfortunately, I'm, I'm warning him. I'm warning yeah, unfortunately him. the immigrants who come to this part of the world, they have, they're bicultural. <laughs> there's what, what I call native culture, and there's a new American culture. And they're sometimes competing with one another. Right. They're not, they have not formed into a melting pot as yet, as yet, you know. So in personal issues, I find that many times cultural values are interfering sure. in the proper understanding of a woman's rights, women's rights. All right, the questions are coming in. Uh, one question asks um, that uh, what your um, thoughts are on the Islamic teachings regarding autopsies. They say as a chaplain in a pediatric hospital, there have been questions um, about whether it's permitted under Islam, right. um, both in cases where parents may have the option to choose it, but also where the coroner requires one. If that makes a difference as well. Yeah, autopsies are now conducted without mutilation of the body. They don't cut open the bodies anymore. They can do it, I think, if please correct me how. But also if it if it leads to you see, this is very important to keep in mind that there is a hidden benefit in finding out the forensic of the case. If we know what the reason why the person died 
and what happened, then we are better equipped to save future cases like that. That being the case, it is allowed. You know, we have a classic case in Islamic uh, law. We have um, a father had swallowed a diamond to deprive his son from inheriting it. Mm. And the case came to the lawyers, to the jurists. Then what happened to the diamond? So the, my father swallowed it and he's already buried. And the jury said, well, the surviving orphan is more, you know, has better right to get the diamond, open the grave, mm -hmm. cut him open, remove the, you know, diamond, and then switch, <laughs> so stitch him and put him back. In other words, there are, what, what I think in the Varura, there, there is, when the necessity arises, and when the benefit is known, then autopsy is also allowed mm. in order to find out the reason why the person died, what was the matter, how, because that's what the forensic medicine does. It tries to find out why the person did not survive. And I think that in that case, autopsy is allowed. So even if it is optional and not required, one can agree to it because today, more and more opinions of our scholars in every school of thought are allowing it because it has benefit for the medical field, it has benefit for the persons, you know, for the future diseases that might be controlled by knowing the disease. Go ahead, Pat. There's been a lot of discussion around gender. Uh, my question is what would the prophet say about uh, transgender uh, health care practices for children? It's important to note that in Sharia, there are two genders known, male and female. But there's also a third gender known as khunsa, neutral. In other words, there were, there were cases of birth when the child was born without proper identification of the genitalia, which it was not known. Usually, the research that was done by the scholars, they indicate quite clearly that the gender should be determined as soon as possible so that there are other requirements in the law which, which apply to them, how they can enter the private sections of the home. Because the Muslim homes, by the way, are divided into private and public. So if you're an outsider, you come and sit in the outside veranda. You never enter the house because the house is limited to you because there are women there and they must be protected from, out, from the strangers. So that kind of understanding also goes in the gender. If I have a boy and a, if a son and a daughter growing up together, there comes a time when I have to separate my daughter from my son because they are of different gender. But how about a situation when the gender is not known? Mm -hmm. If the inclination is towards male behavior, then the child should be helped to become male. If the situation is that looks like a male but behaves like a female, then you need to help the child to become female. Also, today, we are reading more and more that what we call sex change surgery is allowed. Hmm. It's not cosmetic. It's a necessity. Because the person will not function any better if he or she were to remain the way he or she is born. And therefore, it is very important to determine because he has a brother, he has brothers, sisters, or she has brothers. In other words, it has to be determined as soon as possible. Sex change, um, surgery, even if I want to be, for example, I want to become a woman, I'm allowed to have the sex, you know, sex change surgery. In other words, there is no prohibition. It's not a cosmetic surgery. It is something that I feel I'm a better function, I function better as a woman than as a man then I can decide. In other words, there's no prohibition against it. And in fact, the uh, identification of the proper gender should start from the very early times. They should not wait until late for the confusion to arise. Like we talk about transgender in our own culture, North American culture. Now we don't know what to do. Can they go in women's toilets or can they go in men's toilets? Because we did not help them out in the beginning. 
And there were no birth certificates in those days. <laughs> so we did not even write whether the child was a male or a female, you know. The family took over and the family did that. Now in these days, when we do that, the important thing that the parents are advised is that don't wait too long to make gender decisions about children. Yeah. A couple more online there. In uh, one general question, I thought was 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 appropriate here is um, ask what recommendations would you have for non-Muslim spiritual care practitioners um, when they're caring for Muslim families? What specific guidance would you give people who are not embedded in the tradition themselves, but trying to offer spiritual yeah, right. care for those right. who are? Um, my understanding of chaplaincy and spiritual caring is that it's universal language. Whether I'm a Christian, a Jew, Buddhist, or Muslim, there's a universal language that I need to adopt in order to help my patients, whom I visit. And I think that it behooves all of us to know each other's traditions. At least minimally, we should be aware of it. Minimally, I should know what Hindus are expecting. Minimally, I should know what Christians are expecting. And I think that would equip me one better to uh, design my universal language in order to see. I see patients of all religions, by the way, although I'm Muslim. But as, a, as a chaplain. As a chaplain. And I, I, I advise, as a spiritual leader, I don't hold back. I'm, I'm actually told in UVA that you need to visit all the patients. You don't just visit Christian or you might also visit an atheist who doesn't believe in anything. How are you going to help that person? And so, in other words, I think the time in, uh, I think the circumstances in our own culture, our context demands that we should be multiculturally and multi-faith preparation to handle some of the responsibilities in the public space. It's like chaplaincy in the prison. You're not always going to see only Muslim prisoners, so to speak. You're going to go there. Now, chaplaincy is increasing. Even the university, you have university chaplaincy. George, Georgetown University has a Muslim chaplain for the first time. Brown University has a Muslim chaplain for the first time. But the Muslim chaplain is not only catering for the needs, spiritual needs of the Muslims, but also helping Christians, Jews. I get more referral from Christian students than from Muslim students. Mm -hmm. There are more Catholic students who come to me for advice <laughs> than Muslim students. Muslim students, as we say, MashaAllah, <laughs> God be praised, they know everything about the religion. They don't need any consultation. <laughs> but C Catholic students are very serious. That's what my 40 years of teaching experience tells me. They come. They want to know. And they, they are very, you know, sincere in their search. So that, this is my experience. You know. Now, I've also heard that the Baptists say Catholicism is not Christianity, it's a cult. But, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. My, my function in the university is that I become the spiritual guide, regardless who comes to me. I think hospital situation even more demands that we should be open to talk to the Christian patients, Jewish patients, be able to read from Christian scripture, be able to read from the Muslim scripture. You know, it's it's a very different world that we are living today. You know. Good, okay. So, so I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, maybe it goes back to the Shura phenomena um, with regard to a number of the things that you explained. Uh, are benefits of collective decision processes. Um, it also seemed that there might be a number of harms that are relevant and in consideration through that collective deliberation that are contrary to much of what's practiced in North America. Uh, in other words, a harm sufficient to uh, impact a decision usually has to be very severe, very credible for the child. Um, whereas it seems, from what you were saying, harms to the future well-being of the family, 
to the accommodation of a child in the home, uh, perhaps finances, uh, all of these things are relevant harms that are worthwhile of consideration during the Shura process. How does that map out in your council in the North American healthcare context? My, um, my attempt has always been to concretize harms rather than to speak speculatively about it. Um, when you work in the families, by the way, you, you get a good sense of how the family is meeting its financial obligations, how the family is meeting its psychological responsibilities. Sometimes I find the mother is psychologically very disturbed or the father is very psychologically disturbed and it harms indirectly the child. And it's not very really easy um, if I don't have that idea, by the way. So my work has been forcing myself to do more homework through the conversations, find out what's happening. Not that I want to be creepy and find out what, how the family lives, but I want to understand that if I'm tomorrow going to make a decision, advise them, do I have enough concrete evidence to present to them? To say, look, this might happen this way. Look, you are working today and you are feeding the entire family. There's one case, UVA, that I went and I was a consultant. The woman was feeding the entire family. The, father, the husband was, had third stroke. And the doctors were saying, we can't do anything to help. And I, I, I put a very blunt question that, if you keep your husband alive, uh, will you be able to work? Will you, will you be able to take care of the children? Their children to be taken care of. Nobody else is helping you. And you are working day and night to feed the whole family. Here's a husband who will need even more extra care because now here's, this is the third stroke. That means there'll be no movement, nothing. After two, three hours of understanding this, she finally said, I'm not going to insist for him to be kept alive. Imagine sometimes he's a child. Sometimes he's a young son, young daughter, you know. All of these cases, in other words, what we try to do is in the, in the clinical situation, you concretize the situation and talk to them. In American impersonal, very professional ethics, we tend to not ask personal questions. We say it's none of our business. They will sort it out. But what we, I think, should tell ourselves also is that this culture is not individualistic like ours. They are collective. They talk to each other. They, they, are, they don't mind being asked. And we need to find out more about them than simply knowing our patient professionally. And I think that um, it's very, very uh, difficult to... I had my first heart attack at UVA when I was 44 years old. And I was, those days, they had just introduced what you call the blood, t blood thinner. And, you know, when you go to the hospital, they make a sign this and sign that. Out of 10,000, one dies. I said, oh, give me, give me everything I'll sign. I, I want to live anyways, because I took two small children. And, you know, there was, looking back in those days, now that I'm a chaplain, I said how insensitive my physicians were. They did not even try to know what my wife is going through. And my wife was, you know, without, we, we had no parental support, nothing. My in-laws were in, in East Africa. And when I look back, I say, if they had asked my wife, they would have, if they had talked to my wife, they would have found much more about me and my situation. I think many a times, maybe things are changing now in the hospital that we are multicultural and multi-faith, you know, we are learning about other cultures, things might change. But you're absolutely right that harms, if they're not concretized, is very difficult to convince. And it could turn into a more harmful situation. I do agree. 
because that means you have not considered your terms of reference very carefully. You are subjectively talking about it, and it's not going to help the family to make a decision. We are near the end of uh, our time. Let me once again recommend if people want to learn more about this, Dr. Sachadina's book is the, uh, on Islamic bioethics is out there on Amazon. Go ahead, order it, read it, get the Quran, look up the references, um, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer an email. If you send yes. him one. Send me email whenever you have a question. I will be glad to answer that. I'm good in answering my emails, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. wait for second day. <laughs> uh, let me remind you, next week, same time, Jennifer Blumenthal Barbie on biases and heuristics. The week after that, James Mumford coming to our webinars. Thanks again to the Claire Giannini Trust and Children's Mercy for putting on these uh, webinars. And thanks so much for coming to Kansas City. It's my pleasure. Thank you.